Is magic evil? I wanted to address some frequently asked questions or points that are brought up against magic. You have two main groups that consider magic as evil. You have Christians, mostly King James, and I understand there may be Christians who understand white magic, but you have these Christians that view magic as evil or demonic. Then you have this new category of people that is more broad, it's not a group, but a variety of different people who are aware of the cabal and global elite. And they look at them and see that they practice similar philosophies, so the conclusion is that, oh, well magic must be evil and wrong because the Cabal have these same practices. These are the main people who have this perspective that magic is something evil instead of some natural process. The rest of the audience is likely composed of people who have either had a magical experience, someone who's just learning about spirituality in the occult, or someone who doesn't really know about magic. And, you might have the atheist that denies that magic even exists. But this video is more focused towards the first two groups. So what's magic? Magic is the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with the will. Technically, any goal that you set and then do is a manifestation of your will, hence magic. But the wider picture is that magic is a phenomenon more directed to manifestation done through mind alone. Meaning, causing change in the physical world through thought. Now this isn't normal everyday habitual thought, but as was said, a science and art of thinking. Another aspect to magic is states of consciousness. The atheist doesn't believe in magic because he's stuck in a very physical state of consciousness. We all experience different states of consciousness on a day-to-day -day basis, such as dreams and sleeping, but there are different practices that have been developed for over thousands of years. An esoteric system was developed in which through ritual, Changes in the real world could be manifested through mind power or will alone. It's important to note that magic only works in a god-based universe. The idea is that there's only two cosmologies, that of something, spirit, and that of nothing, materialism. The modern day cosmology is that of materialism, which is the belief in cage of the modern day atheist. In order to practice magic, we have to understand the concept of a hierarchy of spiritual planes, with the top plane being the godhead or source. Check out the Astral Plane Explain series if you want more info on these other planes of existence. Now again, there's this idea that because the King James Bible is against magic, or the simple fact that the Cabal themselves use this knowledge, that magic is totally evil and should not be practiced. There's a lot of moving parts to consider, so let's get started. The first point to make is that Christianity is based and was birthed out of what we now call the Pagan Tradition. Check out the Christian Origin series for more information on this history. Magic is not new, and is the most ancient art form that we have, the science and art of manifesting through will. The first major point to make is to inform on the history of the ancient mystery schools. Magic has an honorable past, and it is the foundation of all religions. It was the philosophy of nobility, and the most advanced thinkers of our ancient past practiced this ancient science and art. It's difficult to summarize, but let's do a quick overview of how the tradition of magic came to be. Now remember, we are in the cosmology of something, or spiritual planes, so this isn't the history that we're taught in schools such as floating rocks in space and evolution. In the cosmology of spiritual planes, we have slowly de-evolved from our original god state into the current physical state we are currently experiencing. The reflection and the creation of base attributes of being, the zodiac, the planetary sephiroths that are the archetypal forces of our universe slowly started to mix and flow. You could say their energies trinkled down to the lower planes and created the vast variety of different thoughts and ideas. These thoughts then formed into concrete identities. As these identities begin to take life of their own, you begin to see the creation of concrete forms. Fluidity begins to halt as spiritual forces stop shape-shifting in an everlasting cyclic process and begin to create concrete forms with boundaries. This is the moment where you can start separating subject from object. This is the creation of the astral realm. For many aeons, we were beings on this astral realm, and you could say we were very primitive and pagan in our magical ways. There was evil, and there was good. But a philosophical system of spirituality had not been developed yet. This was still a very chaotic period in our magical history. Then came the creation of the material universe. Now this is a controversial subject, as the Gnostics do say that we were 
trapped in the material realm and all this other stuff, but to quickly comment on that. I think Gnosticism and Nihilism got mixed up along the way and created this very negative spiritual outlook on magic. These Archons or beings are actually within us. They cannot trap us. They are our chakras. They are the planetary archetypal forces that first began inside of you. They are simply different attributes of yourself or of your god self. I suspect that Gnosticism came after the Church of Iessa, so that's the next big point to make. Many of us are aware of Atlantis. Atlantis was a civilization that was semi-physical, semi-astral. You might as well say that they were on the astral plane because they were a nation of magicians with magical technology. After the destruction of Atlantis came the Church of Iessa, where we begin to see the beginning of pagan philosophies from Atlantis be turned into the first world religion. Now Atlantis wasn't necessarily pagan, but their system of astral theology and magic did not yet have philosophical virtues. That's what brought down Atlantis. It's that there were many evil magicians who had taken advantage of the Golden Age. Not everybody who used magic was evil, but the power became unbalanced, and so the next cycle began. Quick note, it seems every time there's a fluctuation of spiritual consciousness or awareness, it's as if this is followed by some event to restart the system, as if this causes some type of collective overload. Now, after Atlantis, the world needed to be rebuilt, and the first notable civilization to do this is the Church of Iessa. Not too much is known about this church because it's been renamed and suppressed by presumably the Jesuit Catholics. This was done during the Roman Wars when they were trying to remove the Druids as a threat. From Connor McDary, quote, It was the idea held by the leaders of the Roman church and state, they were practically one, that all power should be centralized in the head of the church who was also emperor of the state, and any and all religious institutions which in any way conflicted with this ideal were to be done away with. For this reason, the mystery cults were suppressed and initiation into the ancient or esoteric mysteries were forbidden so that no religious establishment, worship, or practice would exist which would draw and hold men to it other than the Roman state church. And besides, as the study and preparation necessary for those who were selected for initiation into the higher mysteries was such as to develop a highly philosophic and spiritual state of mind, such study and preparation did not comport with the object which the church rulers had in view. Such minds would not yield adherence to a mere political and idolatrous church whose doctrines were, in the main, intended for the uninstructed multitude. Such minds could not be dominated by a political or mercenary priesthood. They were enlightened men and they stood in the way of the church project. Therefore, the institutions which produced such men were to be suppressed. Quote, the Great Pyramid and the group of which it is premier, together with the temples of the Nile Valley are the most convincing witnesses and testimonials offering no chance for contradiction or uncertainty as to the accomplishments and genius of the Irish, or as it is called in history, the Aryan race. Quote, in their great missionary pilgrimage, they circled the globe in order to give religion and knowledge of God to the different races of mankind. They also established priesthoods and gave alphabets to the races who were unenlightened in such matters up to this time. Let's just stop there for a second. We're about to connect that with Tartaria and the Church of Iessa and how they traveled across the world and established this first global civilization after the flood. Let's continue. Quote, Ireland is the country in which the arts and sciences were first discovered and developed. To this country, the Greeks applied the term Ogia, a term which was never given but to the very ancient, and it is from the Irish Aryans that the Greek traced their descent, from Donnelly's Atlantis, page 458. Quote, it is to the Irish Magi we owe the discovery of fire and the common grains, which they developed from the grasses. They were the first people to practice agriculture. They invented the common tools of workmanship, which have come down to us practically unchanged from those ancient times. There were other civilizations that were creating contributions after the flood. It wasn't just the Church of Iessa. However, they are the first ones to notice because they are responsible for re-educating the entire world after the flood and what we now call the Bible. This may be shocking to some, but hang in there as I try to unveil this information. So what or who was the Church of Iessa? It's what we call the ancient Celts, Druids, or the ancient Aryans of the past. It gets confusing because this group has been mixed with many different cultures, such as the early Phoenicians, the Greeks, the early Romans, and the early Hebrews. They erased them by dividing them up into different cultures and names, but they could only change it so much. There's still evidence of this Celtic connection etymologically. Now, historians will tell you that this group came from the east, from Mongolia, but this is to cover the history of Atlantis. There was a migration from west to east after the flood. 
One of the clues are the many maps that show the vast amount of architecture and cities all over the area that we now call Tartaria. In Tartaria Explained Part 1, we talked about how Tartar is Gaelic and it means thief. But it also means confusion. Maybe they were given that name on purpose? And this is the best part. In this old Gaelic etymological book, it says the word Tartar is often accounted for by the story of an Irish soldier who in some eastern battle called out that he had caught a Tartar. Eastern battle? Could this be the massive architectures and civilizations that we see in the east in these old maps? After Atlantis, a group of survivors landed in Ireland. At this time, the Black Fomorians were inhabiting Ireland. I have more info on this on the Secret Black History videos. There was a big war, and this is repeated in the legends of the Tuatha de Danann and others. But over time, this civilization, the ones that we hear in fairy tales and whatnot, is actually not that long ago. Maybe 500 to 600 years ago? It's hard to tackle that all at once, but I can explain that as we go along. Now this group, as soon as they succeeded, colonized Ireland, Britain, and Spain, and began to move to the east. In the past, these lands were all owned by the ancient Druids, and at one point, these land masses used to actually be merged together. But that's another story. The Druids went all the way to Russia and China and created a global empire. This culture at this point was no longer Irish or Celtic. This is now a global civilization, and we're at the 400, 300 year ago point now. Many different sects and cultures were developed from this church, creating the variety that we see today. When we present Tartaria, because I get people commenting all the time saying Tartarians were a very specific culture, well, we're not necessarily talking about that. We're talking about the white giant remains that can be found all around the world, similar myths and cultures that talk about red-haired giants that came and brought advanced civilization with them. Even the native Indians in America have legends about giants who possess electrical technology 300 to 500 years ago. So then why say Tartaria? It's really about semantics. We're talking about the last global civilization, the ones responsible for all the similarity in architectures around the world, the ones who passed spirituality and religion after the fall of Atlantis into the new world. And they had cities and architectures in South, North America, Cambodia, China, Turkey, Iran, and it goes on and on. That's why you see the blue eyes in many of these cultures around the world, including similar dances and cultural references. They're just slightly varied based on the location. And don't get me wrong, some cultures are drastically different, but how can you explain the coincidence of similar archetypal and religious themes from around the world? There was one system. This is what we refer to as Tartaria, an advanced global civilization that was erased from history in the past 500 years basically. It has nothing to do with the Tartars specifically. I've mentioned this in other videos. Now let's get into what were the mystery schools. There are two factors. You have the mystery schools after the church of Iessa was destroyed and taken over by the Jesuit church, and they created these mystery schools sort of as a refuge for occultists and developing these abilities in secret. Okay, then you have the mystery schools that were during the church of Iessa. Now remember, the church of Iessa is not modern day Christianity, but it is its foundation. They didn't see magic as evil, but as a tool for spiritual enlightenment. I'm sure they had regulations for people who had any intention to use magic for evil. Which brings me to my next point, which is the concept of witches, Satan, and magic specifically being associated with evil came from the Jesuit church themselves, or the Cabal. They purposefully created this view on magic in order to confuse us from our own power that lies within. And I'm sure there's many of you right now that are still denying the existence of an earlier Bible or the Church of Iessa, but let's take a look at some of the forgeries created by the church and the inconsistencies that are pushed in the modern day. Now. This is pretty lengthy, I mean, a lot to cover just for one single video or even a single book. Quote, As I have shown by citations that forgeries were committed, I shall prove by explanations that our Bible is an Irish book of pre-Roman times and an out-and-out -out theft without acknowledgement from the Irish Church of Iessa. Any competent person who knows the Irish language cannot fail to recognize it. Quote, our present version of the Bible then is an authorized adaption from the original Irish scriptures with alterations and additions made from time to time by Roman and British churchmen in secrecy as they deemed it necessary and advisable to do so. Quote, the following agreement in the writings under the names of Matthew, Mark, and Luke regarding the impression made upon the people by the teachings of Jesus is an example which shows plainly the work of forging priests. It would be impossible for such agreement to have occurred in the original writings of any three men writing individually and independently on any subject whatsoever. But in fabrication from the older works and collaborating, 
The pre-scribe simply blundered and made each of the three witnesses write down and repeat the same identical expression in copy as to how Jesus impressed the people. Here is the forged testimony. Matthew says, They were astonished at his doctrine. Mark says, They were astonished at his doctrine. Luke says, They were astonished at his doctrine. Quote, Many authors and critics have commented upon and pointed out the inaccuracies and inconsistencies of the scriptures and many of them have stated their firm belief that they were copied from older books. But none of them could obtain a clue beyond a surmise which was far from the truth and none of them was able to produce the real facts which was necessary to convince. Quote, they found so many flaws in it, which the jugglers did not cover up, that it kept the question open until the solution was found. The true source has escaped discovery until now. At least, it has never been disclosed to the knowledge of mankind as a whole. The Irish scriptures were altered and adapted to the scheme of the church in order to make the fable of Iessa a historical and geographical fact. Names from the scriptures were given to the places in Syria during its occupation by the crusaders to bear this out. It also suited the purpose of British statecraft to obscure and suppress all evidence of the greatness and culture of the Irish nation than whom no people in the world's history have reached greater heights both spiritually and intellectually, nor have suffered greater injustice at the hands of priestly impostors or political oppressors. Quote, the men who were engaged in executing this literary fraud committed as well as the audacious crime of completely effacing all evidence of credit due to the Irish nation for the most brilliant and glorious service to civilization and human enlightenment. It almost passes belief that a fraud so stupendous could escape so long without discovery. But when we consider the thoroughness and extent to which the plot was carried out, and the magnitude of the forces which were employed in the work, it's not so much to be wondered at. Forces such as the Roman Empire, with its world power, then the Roman Catholic Church, and the British Kingdom, with propaganda systemically spread abroad in order to create a false impression of everything pertaining to the past history of Ireland and her people. These are the forces which have perpetrated and profited by this great fraud. The deception is still continued and the secret jealously guarded by both the Roman Church and Britain from the world at large, but more particularly from the Irish people who have suffered so much from those two adverse forces. The men who executed this plot were acting jointly in the interest of both Rome and Britain. Even to this day, the British government does not encourage, even if it will allow, excavations or investigations to be made about the Hill of Terra in Ireland. Let's just stop there for a second. There's a lot to read, but he gives a couple more examples of the usage of Irish symbols being used in the Bible. I'll try to add a couple more. Quote, I'll give two citations here, with more to follow, to show that the names of many of the characters in the Bible are plainly Irish, and it is because of this fact that the Irish Roman Catholic priest would not allow the Irish Catholics to read the Bible. They were told not to read it, that it was not a sufficient rule of faith. The real reason was that some of the Irish people might recognize the Irish names in a Jewish Bible and ask questions that it would embarrass them to answer satisfactorily. Nevertheless, it is a very astonishing thing that now appears so clearly fraudulent could have escaped detection for so long a time. It will therefore be a surprise to Bible readers of today who have had no suspicion of this deception to be told that it was through the medium of the Irish language that the true key would be found for the solution of the mystery of the origin of the Bible. The proof of this fact is here to given for all mankind to see and know. Quote, the first of the two citations to be given in this chapter is from the book of John, chapter 3rd, 23rd verse. Quote, and John was baptizing in Aenon near to Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. In the latest revision of the Bible, the doctors have altered the word of Aenon and have made it Enon. In the older version, it is Aenon. This is a compound of two Irish words. Ain, meaning a circle of the sun, a year, and on, also a name of the sun. The complete word itself means the sun. The word on also signifies cause, reason, swiftness, fierceness, eagerness, excellent, noble, good, and also wolf dog. These are qualities and attributes associated with and applied to the solar sun. And to the sun god by the Aryan or Irish priest of Iessa, their theology was based on the idea that the supreme deity never had nor has a name. He is only known by attributes as the good or god, holy most high, etc. and as the solar sun in the center of light. And his great representative or sun in our system, the sun god, is named after the qualities and attributes of some idea such as the horseman or charioteer, the strong one 
or Samson, or the fierce one, Homs, the heavenly wolf, who was eager, swift, and fierce. The Irish, during their sojourn in Egypt, gave the name of On to one of their cities in the Nile. The city of On, the city of the sun, was afterwards called Heliopolis by the Greeks and Romans, or actually the Venetians. Salem is a Hebrew word, but the basis of it is in the Irish word solas, light, as Hebrew is a jargon of the Irish. It follows more or less closely the root it is taken from, as will be seen. So Salem means the city of God or light. Let's continue. Quote, the meaning of this myth is that John, Ain, the sun, was baptizing in Aenon, the city of the sun, near to Salem, the city of God, in the realm of light, the celestial kingdom. Where else could such a being as the pure and perfected man be said to dwell? In this myth, John, Ain, Aeon, or Ain, three forms of the word and all pronounced Ain, represents the redeemed and glorified man, man at the highest stage of spiritual attainment, next to the messianic state, so that in his succeeding life or incarnation here again on earth, he will be the Messiah. In the Irish mythic narrative of the Bible, we see that after John, the prophet and the holy man comes the perfected man God, the Messiah, Iessa, Jesus. Quote, this is an example of the esoteric truth and wisdom which lies hidden beneath the veil of the scriptural allegory as formulated by those inspired Irish adepts. And though they have been denied the credit of authorship through a thieves compact of silence, their wisdom and their works still exist in both the Bible and the Great Pyramid of Iessa. Like I said, there's definitely more to go over, but this is a pretty big claim to cover in a single video. There's a lot to look at. But most of the confusion lies in that when the Jesuits took over the church, they added a thousand years to our history, renamed many ancient historians, forged manuscripts, and changed the dating of everything to give this illusion that Rome was in power for a thousand years longer than it really was. So the major point to take from this is that in the last thousand years, there was a major global civilization that made architectures around the world and they didn't fall till about 200 to 300 years ago, maybe even more recent. A second cataclysm happened, not the flood, but something that caused this civilization to be destroyed. Then the Jesuit Catholic Church came in, took this knowledge, rewrote history, converted the system to their own system, and left out any ability for someone to gain this power through their own accord. They must reach God through the church. It wasn't like this in the church of Iessa. Okay, so now we move on to King James. So supposedly he had a vision or whatever and was destined to create this English translation. This is still the same Jesuit system, but converted into a more Shakespearean presentation. Now there are multiple things to address. The first is the extreme likelihood, if not fact, that Francis Bacon was the main editor of the King James Bible. Notice how I didn't say create the Bible. I got a lot of comments on the Christian origin series saying, oh, the Bible's far older than King James or Francis Bacon. Obviously, I'm stating that not only was he the main editor for the Bible, but was also Shakespeare. Francis was also the writer of the New Atlantis, where he imagined a technocratic, scientifically run society. He was an occultist that hid secret Rosicrucian symbols within the Bible. The goal was to establish the church as a method for collecting all the esoterically inclined individuals or those with connection to spirit and put them in a mind trap in which they prayed to an unknown God and could only reach that metaphysical power through the church. They took the philosophy and virtues of ancient knowledge and integrated it into a powerful ritual of spiritual tyranny. Now let's slow down there. That doesn't mean there isn't truth in the Bible. And that also doesn't mean that Jesus or a Jesus type figure didn't exist, okay? So let's bring up the Church of Iessa again. Remember, this was the original church. These old Tartarian churches from around the world are from these people. They were not originally designed to be praying centers where demons would suck your spiritual energy, but they were originally designed as sacred geometrical healing centers that would charge the aether body of man. There's also this idea that they use these churches as spiritual transport systems in which they could rematerialize their bodies in different locations. I've talked about how the society didn't eat meat and or food at all since all these cities do not have proper sewer systems in their founding. The reason is because this civilization was on a different wave of spiritual consciousness and technology. Over time, other nations formed independent of this church and began plotting its demise. We see this come out of Rome with the Jesuits after they take over the world through some unfortunate circumstances, whether it be cataclysm, or the sun disappearing, or even some type of plasma apocalypse. You have the early Tartarian age, and the fall of Tartaria. 
The fall of the Tartarian Age is within the last 600 to 300 years, where there were many changes that took place. In the 1700s, California was an island on many maps. There's no possible way that this could be just an error if the history they tell us is true. There's also countless problems for the founding of many cities that many channels have covered the inconsistencies and pointed out that there's many things that don't really make sense. At some point, there was a steampunk type age in Europe and America, where aether free energy technology was being used. This is not necessarily the technology of Tartaria, but after these empty cities of Tartaria were being filled, they began finding ancient advanced technology from the Church of Iessa. They found them in the churches, train stations, and are now called government buildings. These were re-engineered to develop many of the technologies that we use today. There were still leftover nations of Tartaria in this age, and it wasn't until 1812 that they had been fully conquered. Now, early Tartaria is within the last thousand years. This is at its prime. We hear about this in many of the myths around the world, where teachers came and taught the arts and sciences and fundamentals of civilization. They established their spiritual priesthood around the world. And look, I'm not really one of those zeitgeist guys, you know, that brings up astro theology and just says, you know, Jesus never existed. I think he could have possibly been a druid. But this is ultimately the story of a spiritual helper who existed during this time of cataclysm to come and help others who were unaware of their spiritual power from within. Fomenko, which if you haven't heard of his work, suggests a completely different chronology than our modern timeline. He suggests that the dates for the Old Testament are actually of a much more recent time, and it is the New Testament that is actually of a more ancient origin. Maybe it's possible that Francis Bacon and other Jesuit occultists of the New World decided to create the Bible in such a cryptic and spiritually influencing spell that would ban humans from using magic or pursuing spiritual enlightenment for themselves. Maybe they thought that this was the best way to protect humanity from another cataclysm. As I mentioned with Francis Bacon's book, The New Atlantis, they wanted to create a scientifically run society or tyranny that will be the new Atlantis. It won't fall and fail like the last one. Was that the goal? Well, how would they accomplish that? Well, they would just completely remove magic from the picture. Yeah, but we can't just take it away. It's not something physical. It's a natural right and process of reality. You have to relabel it and give another solution. The solution was... All you have to do is believe in Jesus and you will be spiritually saved. Don't go through the work and training of mind that is required to go through such an ancient sacred tradition of understanding and knowing God. All you need is this physical book and Jesus and you will have everything you need. For many, that's true. And there's no intention to take that away from you. However, if we look at the tyranny of the church and the removal of knowledge of the past age of the church, we see a deliberate attempt to remove ancient knowledge from passing on into this next age. Ancient knowledge is the perception of the world, it's the cosmology of the past. They needed to remove this concept that God is actually within man. This is the foundation for how the original church had practiced their philosophy and it was not seen as blasphemous at all. Many advanced intellectual minds were created from this ancient philosophy of spiritual planes and faculties resulted from their practice. Modern examples of magic include Satanism, which has nothing to do with the ancient tradition. They just have radicalized a compressed and oversimplified version of magic for evil and sometimes simply for cultural influence. New Ageism is the wokeness in spirituality. Things like the secret law of attraction or these cringy occult stores that are trying to sell spirituality to you. They have made occult knowledge look like a joke in the modern day. Then you have these elite cabal Luciferians, if you want to call them that, or who are taking part in magic. So is magic evil? No. First off, if it wasn't for many of these individuals, I'm not sure we would know anything about the occult. Sure, I think many of these individuals partook in spreading propaganda to a degree, but let's just, let's just take Manly P. Hall, for example. Now, there are some weird things about his story for sure, and he was a high-ranking Freemason or whatever, but that by no means takes away the knowledge presented in his works. You can call him evil, you can say he's elite, but until you actually read his works, you'll find it's just not the case. Magic is not only the ability to make change in the real world through different practices and the implications that follow, such as the cosmology of mind over matter, but it's the foundation for spiritual practice and enlightenment. We shouldn't avoid it simply because we see different elite figures who want to use it for control. If anything, it might be the only way to escape tyranny is to reclaim our natural born magical powers and consciousness. Magic is a tool. You use it on a daily basis. If you're a Christian, 
you do it unconsciously. Praying is a form of magic. You're wishing for something to happen through a ritual of asking God in some form of repetitive mantra. Any type of hope thinking or belief is a form of magic. Speaking in tongues, baptism, candle lighting, the Eucharist, bell ringings are just some examples of Christian magic. Magic also includes the realm of natural magic, sprites, nature forces, fairies, as above, so below. These are natural foundations for the way our reality works. You can't just take that away and you can't just claim it's evil. So why would you want to do magic? Well, if you're asking that, you must mean consciously, as it's a part of the way this realm works and it's a natural process within our consciousness. Why would you want to do conscious magic? To develop faculties for more inner awareness, spiritual astral journeys during dreaming, intuition, guidance, knowledge, and or developing the self and influencing creativity. It is the influence of the genius. Hopefully soon we can change our perspective on magic to preserve it for generations to come. Assist in this process by liking, subscribing, maybe even tell a friend. And all we can hope is that our minds may be unveiled. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question, do I truly understand what this reality is?